Okay, welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Coffee Microcaps Fund Manager interview series where we chat to one of uh, our microcap fund managers on two stocks that are in their portfolio. I'm delighted to say we're joined by Martin Pretty from Equity Investors. Martin, how are you? Great, thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, good to have you. Listen, before we get into the two stocks, um, maybe just give us a, an overview of the strategy that you employ there. You know, what kind of microcap stocks or investment thesis uh, are you looking for when you're looking at microcap uh, names? Sure. So we say that we look across microcap, small cap, emerging companies. Um, we're generally looking for the companies that uh, not well loved by the market, so they don't have large broker coverage. Um, they're not um, the sexy high-flying names. Uh, that's where we tend to look for opportunities, I guess, to be a bit early. And um, ho hopefully they become far more popular at some point after we've invested. Um, probably two-thirds of the portfolio is sub $100 million market cap. Uh, there's, there's no set target for that, but that just tends to be the way it is because that's where we find the opportunities that excite us. Uh, we focus on financials, industrials, technology, um, health. We don't do early stage drug development. We don't do mining exploration. Uh, we think we've got plenty to play with uh, doing, doing what we feel most competent doing. We target rough, up, up to 20% of the portfolio in unlisted investments. Uh, at the moment, it's slightly more than that due to a revaluation we had to put through. Um, and that, that, so for example, we've got a loom, which is a large publicly public company that's unlisted um, and is providing laboratory testing solutions and home kits for testing COVID and influenza. Um, what else can I tell you? No, I think that's a good, a, a good, a good overview. Um, yeah, a bit like kind of what Coffee Microcaps focuses on. We generally don't. Uh, you know, bring to our audience, you know, stuff from the mining or the biotechnology space. It's all those kind of other micro cap sectors you talked about, financial services, technology, industrial products, businesses. Um, so let's get into the first one, uh, micro cap technology name, MedAdvisor, uh, the code's uh, MDR. And tell us, you know, how do these guys make their money for anybody who, who wouldn't be familiar with MedAdvisor's business model? Sure. So MedAdvisor is, a, as of today, largely an American revenue-based business, but it's originally an Australian business based in the Melbourne suburb of Camberwell. And so it basically built out a business in Australia that it's now trying to take to the world. It, um, its key focus is on adherence to medication, and it generates three key revenue sources from that. So you've got pharmacists, drug companies, and consumers or customers or patients. The pharmacists pay subscription fees to have software from MedAdvisor sitting on their uh, computers in their, in their shops. And that enables them to communicate with their customers. The residents, pardon me, the consumers have an application on their phone in Australia that they can download for free that connects them to their pharmacist and allows them to manage their medication uh, more recently to order directly and even to have it, have it home delivered. And the, there are fees, the revenue from that from transaction fees to MedAdvisor. Um, then then the, um, the, the cherry on top is revenue from the pharmacy, pardon me, from the pharmaceutical companies that um, pay fees to MedAdvisor to be able to communicate directly with the users of their drugs through the app. And uh, that's quite a lucrative part of their business. Now we stepped to the US where they recently bought a company called Adherus. And Adherus is all about communicating with the consumers, uh, traditionally using paper-based solutions. So MedAdvisor's strategy now is to digitize communication to those consumers, those uh, patients buying, purchasing drugs through pharmacies and um, go backwards effectively from the Australian business model. Okay. So is the investment thesis here, you know, they've got a, you know, well-established 
profitable Australian business. So you, they know the model works. Is it now trying to take that model internationally? Because I, I know the US is a big focus for them, but they are operating, you know, I think bits up in Asia I saw, and, you know, they're trying to maybe um, replicate it in the UK market as well. Is that kind of the, the long-term thesis for you for MediBuzzer? Uh, yeah, co correct. So it is a case of they've proven a product up locally. Um, it basically, if they took out the development expenditure, they probably make money in the Australian business. Um, they are now applying that in the US through the acquisition, also in Asia through a joint venture with a partner of theirs, and also in the UK. Um, Asia and the UK are early stage. So the UK, they're just rolling out to the first 50 pharmacies, I believe, this quarter. Uh, Asia, they've had a few small uh, launches and it's progressively ramping up. But, but the big immediate gain is the US where they've made an acquisition that makes their, brings their revenue up to, say, in Australian dollars, 70 million revenue um, for a $100 million market cap company. Yeah, so the, those other markets are kind of a, a little bit behind in the in the implementation curve compared to where, where, where they are in the, in the US. And, Correct, um, but I guess the, the long-term growth opportunities. Yeah, exactly. And then some of the risks, I mean, the obvious one, Australian companies going overseas, you can look from the biggest to the smallest of ones who kind of got their fingers burned badly do, doing this. And um, is that kind of the key risk you see or is there, you know, other, other things to kind of consider uh, around either their existing Australian business um, or, or is it just that actually being able to execute um, internationally? Um, indirectly, that, that's the answer. So I think they know the business they've bought very well. They had an existing partnership with that business. They've had uh, people involved as advisors and on their team who have been at business. But what their strategy is, is, is to change that business, to evolve it from the old paper-based ways to a digitised, modern uh, approach to communication. And I guess, that to me, the risk is how successfully they can pull that change off and also how successfully they can um, return. So the business, when they bought it, was effectively an unloved part of a much larger business and its revenue had been stagnating. So they know what it did historically and they've got ambitions to restore it to its former revenue glory and beyond. And I guess the risk is the longer it takes to get the, the, um, the, the longer it takes until we get to earnings. Yeah. So if we're, if we're looking, you know, out, you know, the next three, six, nine months, you know, for the balance maybe of 2021, I know they're in Appendix 4C reporter. And, um, you know, what, what should we be looking out for them with, you know, the Appendix 4 season, and the results in August? Is, is the key thing to look for how, how that traction is, is building in the US market? Or, you know, do we need to kind of keep an eye on the Australian business as well, even though it's kind of at a much more mature stage? Um, I think the catalyst will be what happens overseas. So in Australia, they're in, uh, I think it's 65% off the top of my head of pharmacies. Um, they're well established. The business model's proven. Um, but so we go to the US and that, that's where they've taken it. They put their, laid their bet with the acquisition. Um, the catalyst there is so they, they are trying to expand their reach. And off the top of my head, I think they currently reach 25 million um, Americans potentially, and they've said that they're in uh, discussions with parties that would expand that to, I think it's 60, 65 million off the top of my head. Uh, so that, that would be one piece of news to be looking out for. Um, following that, there'll be the rollout in the UK and how successfully that goes and advances in Asia. But I think investors will also be looking very carefully at the next quarterly cash flow. Uh, so if you go back in recent time, they uh, put out a cash flow statement for March that was incredibly good in terms of almost a very minimal burn. Uh, but more recently, they put out, sorry, that was for December quarter. And more recently for the March quarter, they put one out where there was probably more burn than the market anticipated based on the previous result. And that was 
due to a number of factors, the largest of which was one of their major pharmaceutical company clients shifted its terms of payment. So revenue that would have normally been banked in the March quarter is now being banked in this quarter. So I think that's going to be something the market will watch pretty closely. Okay, so yeah, exactly. This is that cash burn as they kind of come out of this big development implementation expenditure and the, hopefully the, the revenues start flowing in now at the end of this project. Okay, great. Okay, interesting. Let's move on to the, the second one. Um, Maggie Beer, our long table group for longer watchers might have known it has. Um, more of a value turnaround play, uh, I, I would suggest, but for anybody who, who doesn't know, maybe just tell us how they make their money um, and sure. maybe a, a quick history of, of its listed life to date, I think would be instructive. So just, just for complete um, disclosure, so I've got a, there's a non-executive director of Equitable Investors who is also a non-executive director of uh, Maggie Beer, who has no input into the day-to-day -day investment, but just so you know that, and okay. listeners, viewers know that connection exists. Thank you. Um, Maggie Beer, the, I mean, I've, I've been around the market since 2000 and the company was originally called Jumbuck and was a subscale social media and uh, online classifieds. It morphed into popular opinion. It then morphed into long table and got a stake in Maggie Beer's business. Um, and we finally come to today's position where it has pre a recently announced acquisition. It, it has three key businesses. The Maggie Beer Gourmet Food business, which I imagine many people would be familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, then a dairy business in South Australia called Paris Creek. That was probably a, a problematic acquisition when it was first made, but has now emerged into positive EBITDA in the last half. And a dairy business called St. David's that sells milk into kind of cafes and restaurants and similar businesses uh, originally based in Melbourne from which they've expanded. Um, and those three businesses are the base. And so how do they make their money? They, they sell their products, the Maggie Beer products through the major supermarkets, through their own online website, through independent retailers. Um, St. David's, as I just said, supplies cafes and restaurants and the organic dairy company supplies milk to various retailers. Um, the gross margin across all three businesses is pretty consistent at the moment at about 46%. So to a degree, it's about getting sales uptake and volume uh, on what we, we think we should be pretty fixed costs below that. So is that um, the, I guess, is that the, uh, the investment thesis for you? Um, I know they've, uh, she's probably there about a year and a half now, the, the new CEO, Chantel. Is it about, you know, the turnaround um, and just getting kind of volumes up across their across their three businesses now that they, I guess, maybe set them all up for uh, up for success. Uh, and I know they're making a big push on, especially on the Maggie Beer side, into e-commerce to tr try and, you know, grow that channel and capture a bit more, bit more higher margin sales as a percentage of kind of the total sales for that business. Yeah, so step one, so they've had a new regime, you're right, they've had a new CEO and a new chairman um, who has a background with food businesses like Buller, SPC and I think Blackmore's before that. Um, so step one is prove that the existing businesses are decent businesses and sustainable and, and growing. And I think with their first half results, they did that. And they did have, at least in the Maggie Beer business, a, a, a strong tailwind from COVID with people um, valuing um, the, the gourmet type food that Maggie Beer makes more than they possibly did in the past. Um, but from that platform, they've also recently made an acquisition. And that acquisition is an online based business. Uh, it sells hampers and gifts and it's expected to do, I think it's $9 million EBITDA, $10 million EBITDA for the top price they'll pay if they pay the earnouts, which would be uh, five times multiple on the acquisition. And I think that is a value play, um, five times EBITDA for a growing online business like that with substantial synergies with Maggie Beer business, I, I, I hope. I, I believe there's an opportunity for synergies there in terms of products. 
and joint product development and distribution and the back end as well. Um, so that acquisition is an exciting part of the thesis for us. Okay. So that's something the the integration uh, of that business definitely is something to watch out for then in the in the next results. Uh, anything else we should be kind of watching out for um, over the let's say the balance of twenty twenty one? Is it is it the integration of the acquisition and, and how the top lines are are tracking across their various business units? Is that kind of the key for them, or or have they got a plan for more acquisitions? So, so they put out an announcement a week ago with an update that said they're now on a run rate, I think it's of $11 million EBITDA for the combined business once they put it together. And that they'd um, some, got some of the Maggie Beer products like broth and sources into new, new products into Woolworths and other stores. And that kind of announcement about new products going to stores and getting distribution, I, I hope we'll see that on a kind of semi-regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, the acquisition itself is to complete this month and so then once that's occurred we'll obviously be looking for updates on further progress on that and i guess if you were going to talk about risks a key risk is they are acquiring a business that's it's it's not a household name um, it there's not a lot of information available publicly about its past and its financials so as a investor in the public company we're we're back in the dd that the board and management have gone through in making this acquisition okay and then that's great and if anybody wants to chat more on these with yourself or find out more about uh, equity investors what's the best way to get in touch sure you can email me at mpretty at equitableinvestors.com.au or you can um, play on the website at www.equitableinvestors.com.au Okay, and I know you're you also on Twitter, social media as well. Yeah, yeah, you're on Twitter as well. What's your what's your Twitter handle again? Uh, at Martin Pretty. At Martin Pretty. Okay, great. So I'm sure uh, I need a FinTwit community here to definitely definitely find you on there. Martin, thank you very much for that, and um, yeah, we we'll look forward to tracking both of those uh, over the course of 2021. All right. Thank you, Mark.